pilot man before, a moment stood, then wondering turned, and speechless walked ashore. Chapter 52 Freights to California Silver bricks Underground mines Timber supports A visit to the mines The caved mines Total of shipments in 1863 Since I desire in this chapter to say an instructive word or two about the silver mines the reader may take this fair warning and skip if he chooses. The year 1863 was perhaps the very top blossom and culmination of the flush times. Virginia swarmed with men and vehicles to that degree that the place looked like a very hive. That is, one, when one's vision could pierce through the thick fog of alkali dust that was generally blowing in summer. I will say concerning this dust, that if you drove ten miles through it, you and your horses would be coated with it a sixteenth of an inch thick and present an outside appearance that was a uniform pale yellow color. And your buggy would have three inches of dust in it thrown there by the wheels. The delicate scales used by the assayers were enclosed in glass cases intended to be airtight. <clears throat> and yet some of this dust was so impalpable and so invisibly fine that it would get in somehow and impair the accuracy of those scales. Speculation ran riot, and yet there was a world of sub substantial business going on too. All freights were brought over the mountains from California, 150 miles, by pack train, partly and partly in huge wagons drawn by such long mule teams that each team amounted to a procession and it did seem sometimes that the grand combined procession of animals stretched unbroken from Virginia to California. Its long route was traceable clear across the deserts of the territory by the writhing serpent of dust it lifted up. By these wagons, freights over that 150 miles were $200 a ton for small lots, same price for all exp express matter brought by stage and $100 a ton for full loads. One Virginia firm received 100 tons of freight a month and paid $10,000 a month freightage. In the winter, the freights were much higher. All the bullion was shipped in bars by stage to San Francisco. A bar was usually about twice the size of a pig of lead and contained from $15,000 to $3,000 according to the amount of gold mixed with the silver, and the freight on it, when the shipment was large, was one and a quarter percent of its intrinsic value. So the freight on these bars probably averaged something more than $25 each. Small shippers paid 2%. There were three stages a day each way, and I have seen the outgoing stages carry away a third of a ton of bullion each, and more than once I saw them divide a two-ton lot and take it off. However, these were extraordinary events. Mr. Valentine, Wells Fargo's agent, has handled all the bullion shipped through the Virginia office for many a month. To his memory, which is excellent, we are indebted to for the following exhibit of the company's business in the Virginia office since the 1st of January, 1862. From January 1st to April 1st, about $270,000 worth of bullion passed through that office. During the next quarter, $570,000. Uh, next quarter, $800,000. Next quarter, $956,000. So, oh, uh, yeah. Next quarter, $1,275,000. And for the quarter ending on the 30th of last June, about uh, $1,600,000. Thus, in a year and a half, the Virginia office only shipped $5,330,000 in bullion. During the year 1862, they shipped $2,650,000, so we perceive the average shipments have more than doubled in the last six months. This gives us room to, pro to promise for the Virginia office 
$500,000 a month for the year 1863. Though perhaps, judging by the steady increase in the business, we are underestimating somewhat. This gives us $6 million for the year. Gold Hill and Silver City together can beat us. We will give them $10 million. To Dayton, Empire City, Ophir, and Carson City, we will allow an aggregate of $8 million, which is not over the marks, per, mark, perhaps. It may possi possibly be a little under. Mm -hmm. To Esmeralda, we give $4 million. To Reese River and Humboldt, $2 million, which is liberal now, but may not be before the year is out. So we prognosticate that the yield of bullion this year will be about $30 million. Yeah. Placing the number of mills in the territory at 100, this gives it to each the labor of producing $300,000 in bullion during the 12 months, allowing them to run 300 days in the year, which none of them, which none of them more than do. This makes their work average $1,000 a day. Say the mills average 20 tons of rock a day, and this rock worth $50, as a general thing, and you have the actual work of our 100 mills figured down to a spot, $1,000 a day each, and $30 million a year in the aggregate enterprise. <clears throat> a considerable overestimate, MT. Two tons of silver bullion would be in the neighborhood of 40 bars, and the freight on it over $1,000. Each coach always carried a deal of ordinary express matter besides, and also from 15 to 20 passengers at from $25 to $30 a head. With six stages going all the time, Wells Fargo and Company's Virginia City business was important and lucrative. All along under the center of Virginia and Gold Hill for a couple of miles ran the great Comstock silver load, a vein of ore from 50 to 80 feet thick between its solid walls of rock a vein as wide as some of New York's streets. I will remind the reader that in Pennsylvania, a coal vein only eight feet wide is considered ample. Virginia was a busy city of streets and houses above ground. Under it was another busy city, down in the bowels of the earth, where a great population of men thronged in and out among an intricate maze of tunnels and drifts flitting hither and thither under a winking sparkle of lights, and over their heads towered a vast web of interlocking timbers that held the walls of the gutted Comstock apart. These timbers were as large as a man's body, and the framework stretched upwards so far that no eye could pierce to its top through the closing gloom. It was like peering up through the clean-picked ribs and bones of some colossal skeleton. Imagine such a framework two miles long, 60 feet wide, and higher than any church spire in America. Imagine this stately latticework stretching down Broadway from the St. Nichols to Wall Street, and a Fourth of July procession re reduced to pygmies parading on top of it and flaunting their flags high above the pinnacle of Trinity Steeple. One can imagine that, but he cannot well imagine what that forest of timbers cost from the time they were felled in the pineries beyond Washu Lake, hauled up and around Mount Davidson at atrocious rates of freightage, then squared, let down into the deep maw of the mine and built up there. Twenty ample fortunes would not timber one of the greatest of those silver mines. The Spanish proverb says it requires a gold mine to run a silver one, and it is true. A beggar with a silver mine is a pitiable pauper indeed, if he cannot sell. I spoke of the underground Virginia as a city. The gold in Curry is only one single mine under there, among the great many others. Yet the gold in Curry's streets of dismal drifts and tunnels were five miles in extent altogether, and its population 500 miners. Taken as a whole, the underground city had some 30 miles of streets and a population of five or 6,000. In this present day, some of those populations are at work from 12 to 1,600 feet under Virginia and Gold Hill, and the sing signal bells that tell them what the superintendent above ground desires them to do are struck by telegraph as we strike a fire alarm. Sometimes men fall down a shaft there, a 1,000 feet deep. In such case, cases, 
the usual plan is to hold an inquest. If you wish to visit one of those mines, you may walk through a tunnel about half a mile long, if you prefer it, or you may take a quicker plan of shooting like a dart down the shaft on a small platform. It is like tumbling down through an empty steeple, feet first. When you reach the bottom, you take a candle and tramp through drifts and tunnels where throngs of men are digging and blasting. You watch them send up tubs full of great lumps of stone. Silver ore, you select choice specimens from the mass as souvenirs. You admire the world of skeleton timbering. You reflect frequently that you are buried under a mountain a thousand feet below daylight. Being in the bottom of the mine, you climb from gallery to gallery, up endless ladders that stand straight up and down. When your legs fail you at last, you lie down in a small boxcar in a cramped incline, like a half-upended sewer, and are dragged up to daylight, feeling as if you are crawling through a coffin that has no end to it. Arrived at the top, you find a busy crowd of men receiving the ascending cars and tubs and dumping the ore from an elevation into long rows of bins capable of holding half a dozen tons each. Under the bins are rows of wagons loading from chutes and trap doors in the bins, and down the long street is a procession of, those, of these wagons winding toward the silver mills with their rich freight. It is all done now, and there you are. You need never go down again, for you have seen it all. If you have forgotten the process of reducing the ore in the mill and making the silver bars, you can go back and find it again in my Esmeralda chapters, if so disposed. Of course, these mines cave in, in places, occasionally, and then it is worth one's while to take the risk of descending into them and observing the crushing power exerted by the pressing weight of a settling mountain. I published such an experience in the Enterprise once, and from it I will take an extract. An hour in the caved mines. We journeyed down into the Ophir mine yesterday to see the earthquake. We could not go down the deep incline because it still has a propensity to cave in places. Therefore, we traveled through the long tunnel which enters the hill above the Ophir office and then by means of a series of long ladders climbed away down from the first to the fourth gallery. Traversing a drift, we came to the Spanish line, passed five sets of timbers still uninjured, and found the earthquake. Here was as complete a chaos as ever was seen. Vast masses of earth and splintered and broken timbers piled confusedly together, with scarcely an aperture left large enough for a cat to creep through. Rubbish was still falling at intervals from above, and one timber which had braced others earlier in the day was now crushed down out of its former position, showing that the caving and settling of the tremendous mass was still going on. We were in that portion of the Ophir known as the North Mines. <clears throat> Returning to the surface, we entered a tunnel leading into the central for the purpose of getting into the main Ophir. Descending a long incline in this tunnel, we had traversed a drift or so, and then went down a deep shaft from whence we proceeded.